So, PAX Prime. Uh, our friends brought a game called Pendante. Pendante and is made by Serlin Games, who you may know from such other games as Yomi and Puzzle Strike. Serlin is the dude who sort of thinks the same things that we do. He's all about winning and playing to win and stuff like that. Uh, and he's a dude who is like big in the fighting game community, but uh, wasn't as good at moving his hands really fast. Right? He's much better at it than we are, but not you know not good enough to be pro. So that's why he made games like Yomi and Puzzle Strike, which are like these skill winning type games, games that let you experience that high level interplay without needing to master basic low level right. skills along the way. So the new game from Sterling Games, relatively new at least, is Pandante. This is the kind of game. That And when we describe it to you, you'll feel this. It's the kind of game that people like us usually will ignore or shit on. Right, so it's Texas Hold'em Poker with two key differences, right? There are other differences, but there are two key differences. Difference number one, pandas. Difference number two, it's a different deck of cards, not your usual deck of cards. Yep, and, and it's interesting because what this game does at its core is it takes, say, uh, Texas Hold'em, mm -hmm. which... You need to be good at poker to enjoy Texas Hold'em. Pretty much. And or have so much money you don't care that you lose. Well, you don't have to play for money. I mean, we didn't play this for money. Wow, Texas Hold'em without money is garbage. Well, then you're just playing for points. <laughs> but that's the thing. Garbage. The, if you play Texas Hold'em, the, the differentiator of skill between like the person who's got like nine points of skill and the person who has eight, po eight points only comes out over a long period of play. Mm. Pendante distills that so that it's a relatively short game. It plays more like a German board game or a, like the kind of tabletop games we like, and you get the brain feel and the excitement of the important rounds of Texas Hold'em without having to play a hundred rounds of Texas Hold'em and without having Where to be... Where most of them, everyone just folds right away. Exactly. And they're for almost no money, and then the big one happens. Exactly. In Pandante, every round is the big round. So this game, much like I said for that My Thing of the Day video, it's a game that has is way more fun than it has a right to be. And we resisted when our friends were like, hey, let's play this game. We were like, we'll play it once so we can review it. And then we finished, and then we all we were like... We played it the most. So we, should we play it again? Should we play it again? Should we play it again? One night, we played it all night until they kicked us out. It was just really... The other thing, it was just so easy to play compared to other games that had much more setup. You know, all this is just... Take a deck of cards, shuffle them, give everyone some chips and play. It's, you know, it's more set up than, say, Sushi Go, yep. but it's a lot less set up even than Seven Wonders. we got to sort all the cards out and everything. So, so the, the, the subtle key difference is, to explain the game in detail, it's pretty simple. You play basically Texas Hold'em, but when you buy into a hand and you bid on a hand, you're not just bidding like, I have the best hand. You're not putting money in saying, I got the best hand or fold. You're betting on what hand you will have by the end. Right. You're betting on a specific hand. There are 10 hands you can possibly have. You put a chip onto one of them. And you can't bet some crazy different amounts either. You can't be like, all in on pair. It's you bet a fixed amount. Or you quit. Right. So it's either bet five on one of the 10 hands or fold. Those are your two options. So I'll bet five on three of a kind. Um, I have a three of a kind is what you're saying. Yep. Or I will, I will have three of a kind. I will eventually have three of a kind. Not I will have at least three of a kind. Not I will have, you know, something at, you know better than three. I will have exactly three of a kind. If you have four of a kind and you bet on three of a kind, well, I guess that includes three of a kind. But yep. you don't get your credit for your four of a kind. You only get the credit for what you bet on. So the game works pretty much like Texas Hold'em in that regard, though, because you go down the river pulling up cards along the way. But yep. every time a new card comes out, you have to bet... You have to fold or bet at or better than what you already bet on. So you might have, like, you might be going for, I don't know, an inside straight, right? And you think... <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea. All right, you might be getting it. You never know. You're not you're, getting you're it. You're only going to spend... You think, I can spend 10 bucks to see maybe a miracle will happen. So you bet on straight. And then you bet on straight again. And then you bet on... And meanwhile, you, you just got, like, a three of a kind... But, uh, sorry, bro. You can't go down. You can you only go up. You can't go down to three of a kind. So even though you have it, it's basically meaningless. So there's another mechanic here. Much like how Texas Hold'em has all of its terminology, its poker terminology, 
Pandante has panda equivalents of that. Mm. So you buy breakfast, you buy, you take breakfast if you want, then you have snacks, and then you do like the paws and the tail and all these little things. So it has this fun little like interplay of mm-hmm. using the words and the yeah. nomenclature of the game to the point that it started messing up my poker right. brain knowledge. So the snacks are actually a big component in the game, right? The way the snacks work is if you are the highest bidder in terms, like I'm betting on straight flush, Fuck straight flush. I got a floosh. That's not as good as a straight flush. I got a floosh. Good. Uh, if you are the highest better at any given snack time, you get free snacks, which means from your you know hidden cards, you can throw some out and you get some You draw a card, and then you may or may not keep that card throwing away another card. Yep. So you still have two cards, but you can swap so in and out. by going big and betting big, you actually have a chance to make that big a reality with all the snacks. You can still get snacks if you are not the highest better, but you have to pay for those snacks. And if, the further away you are from the top, the more you have to pay. So if you're betting on pair and someone else is betting on straight flush, you have to pay like 20 bucks <laughs> to have a chance at snacks. So there's already a good, you know, because what's the fun part of Texas Hold'em? What's the fun part of poker? The big bluffing bluff. and being and everyone falls for it. Yep. And you make mad money when you had nothing. This game distills poker into the bluffing and the odds and nothing else, mm-hmm. and it does it quickly. So I might, uh, I might bet a floosh, even floosh. though I could not possibly have a floosh, and I intend to fold just to make everybody's snacks more expensive. And because I can see, even though I can't possibly have a floosh, maybe the snacks will make a floosh happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> and I'll get free snacks. The game, obviously, because the deck is not a normal poker deck, the hands you can get are different. Right. So there are six suits with ten cards with per suit number one joker. One through ten. One through six, seven, eight. Oh no. Is there is there a ten? Oh, is it two through ten? I think, I think it's, it's two one through ten. through ten. That would make eleven. Yeah. Right. One through know. nine? I don't remember. I think it's two through ten. I don't remember. Anyway. Uh also the six colors and then there's one wild card. Whoa, it's a wild card. Yep. Watch out. It's prismatic. It's got all the colors. And there's some fun rules around that, but there's only one wild card. Yep. And there's some special rules around the wild card. Mm -hmm. So you play the game. You bet. Everybody bets. You buy snacks if you want. And then another card comes out in the the community cards. And then you bet snacks. And you do this three times. And then... The showdown. Everybody gets to use a power. So this is actually another bluffing aspect, right? Based on the colors of the cards in your hand, there are six powers, six colors, six powers. You can It goes around, and each person gets to claim zero, one, or two powers, right? And try to use those powers. So I can be like, I'm going to do the red power twice. The red power is put five bucks in, or everyone puts five bucks in or folds. So doing that twice means everyone in the whole game has to put in ten bucks or fold, except me, because I'm using the power, right? Uh, oh, no, I think I have to do it too, right? I what? No. No? Okay. You don't remember this game at all. I only played it at PAX. It was already a month ago. Um, so, bravery. Every other player must put in five gold right. or fold. So you Playfulness. Use- draw a card, then discard a card, but you have to reveal a card that you kept. Mm-hmm. Orange. Deal a sixth community card. Oh, shit. Everybody gets that. That happens a lot. Uh, blue. Blue. Privately see a random card from a highest hand. So someone who's beating you has a highest hand. You can see a card in their hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, black, the fun one, greed. Steal $5 from the lowest hand unless <laughs> they reveal a blue card from their hand. Mm. Hopelessness, purple. You get to fold. Because normally you can't fold at that point. You're already in too deep. Yep. But that's like last minute folding. So you can pull some shenanigans and then fold if they don't work out. And there's a clever mechanic where if you use a power, you can declare up to two powers because you can have two cards, you know, your car, you have two cards in your hall. Anyone can challenge you, and there's a challenge mechanic. Right. It's so like you, you're not showing your two hidden cards when you use these powers. I'm be like, I'm using two red powers, red power twice. Yep. People can either say, okay, we'll do the red power twice, or they can say, challenge you. You don't have two red cards. The cards are designed in such a way that you can reveal their color without revealing their number. So I have to then either say, yeah, you got me, and then I owe them some money. Yep, because they challenged me and I was lying, I give them money. Or I show them the colors, and then they they owe me money. Yep, they challenged me and they were wrong. I did have two red cards, so they got to give me money. Which can be great 
if, say, I'm bluffing that I have a floosh and I show a card that corroborates my story that I have a flu. Yeah, you might really need, say, to use the orange power to have a chance at this hand winning. But to, using but that you don't implies, have any orange cards. Or using it implies that I don't have the hand and I'm Hail yeah. Marrying right or here. Or you might have a really shitty hand and want to say, purple, I'm going to fold to just get escape, but you don't have a purple and someone calls you out on it and now you lose That's even the more worst. money. <laughs> That's the worst. Or your hand is totally awesome and you want to kick some ass so you use red or black to take money from people. Or, and you just, but you don't have red or black and you get called if out. If you have the crazy awesome hand, sometimes you'll use orange or uh, green just to make everyone think that you're actually bluffing. Yeah, if you're using orange or green, it seems like you're desperately trying to get a good hand. So people will think you don't have the real hand, but all you did was just draw a card and throw one away. Right? And then you go down the challenges. So after the powers, after all that, the cards are out there. Whoever has the highest hand, everyone has a chance to either challenge them right, or say, yeah, you win. You I bet on five of a kind, and no one else bet on anything close to five of a kind. I just win without revealing anything whatsoever unless you challenge me. So challenges in this stage are interesting because in on normal challenges with the powers if you are wrong you owe the other person some money it's not a big deal if you challenge someone's hand and they're winning and you're right you get a little bit of money and of course they don't win mm -hmm. and the next it goes down to the next person if you challenge someone and you're wrong they actually they, have the hand i have five of a kind read them and weep you are Fucked. You owe them so much money. It is devastating. You just lose the game, basically. Yeah. <gasps> so if you are not challenged and you win and you were bluffing, you can tell everyone, yo, dogs, I was bluffing. You're stupid. And then you get to draw a panda lord. This panda lords are so ridiculously waggles. strong. Waggles. It's all about waggles. Fuck everybody else. He pretty much only took Waggles because he was so much better than the other panda. Well, I think we took Waggles mostly because of the Waggle action on the card. That's also an excellent reason to take Waggles. <gasps> but uh, the Panda Lord, if you have him, have one, and you can just take one. There's, a, there's one of every color. They just have weird powers. Like, Waggles' power is the triple play. Quote, during the ability phase, you can play up to three different abilities that cannot be challenged. So you could just be like, red, 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 everyone put 15 in the middle, or fold, everyone right now, and you lose waggles, but, you know, hey, that's ridiculously strong. Yeah. So if you basically bluff your way to victory on one hand, you get a Panda Lord, which comes close to ensuring victory on a future hand. So when it, there's a huge incentive to win via bluffing. So, well, look again, the design of the game is pushing you toward the fun parts of poker, and it's kind of glossing over the really, really tedious parts of poker. Right. But at the same, so while it's basically pushes you, huge incentives just bluff your way to victory, at the same time, it ridiculously punishes anyone for challenging if you're right. So it's like you have this built-in defense making it sort of easier to actually bluff your way to victory because people are scared to challenge you if you actually have the hand because they will just be fucked if, if you do have the hand. Now, in my experience playing the game, nobody ever fucking has the hand except that one time. <laughs> except a few times someone <laughs> had it. <laughs> I guess the early games, pretty much, that we played of this, Everyone's one, like, person, bloosh, bloosh. one person actually had the hand and someone challenged them. That person was out. The person who had the hand won the game in the end because they just got so much money from that. It was over. Yep. Not only did they get the money from winning the pot, they got the money from the person who just got hosed. I think what happened is and our friends... And then they had so much money they couldn't be unseated. They won a second hand. Then they had that was enough money to win the game. But then I think pretty quickly what happened is our friends started getting competent at the game. Part of the problem was that it's not easy to calculate the odds or viscerally feel the odds of the six-color, ten-card deck. Yeah, I, it was very hard to calculate the likelihood of, like, what are the odds he has a flu? Oh, pretty good, actually. There's, like, ten cards of that color, right? So the yeah. odds that those is... He's got two of them. So, like, and a full he's house... Got, he's had, like, five snacks. He's seen, like, seven cards this game. And plus the ones on the table, it's like that could easily be a full floosh, houses, right? Not that hard to get. Flooshes, slightly harder to get. I don't know if it's because it's on the far right side or because we just really like the word floosh. <laughs> Only a panda would know what a floosh is. Yep. It says in the instruction manual. Flu the, the game's flavor text and just the, the art and everything on the cards was well done to the point that 
we started using its terminology despite making fun of how dumb its terminology was when we learned the game. Floosh became the breakaway word of PAX <laughs> for the rest of the weekend. Yeah, fuck your official swear word. Floosh is the official word of PAX Prime 2014. <laughs> I think the problem was we looked up Floosh on Urban Dictionary and came up with something involving a female ejaculation. Sure, whatever. So... A few of us looked that up and laughed about it, and then everyone else came back, and then someone bet on a floosh who was not there when we had looked it up, and that sealed the deal. The other thing about this game is all the pandas on the cards have really great expressions, especially the number one where the panda's putting his the hands red. The panda's putting his hands in the air like what what raise a roof. Our convention was if you win, you have to make the red one pose. Mm -hmm. Unless you win with a panda lord, then you have to make the pose of that panda lord. But basically we kept making the poses of all the pandas and saying floosh a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a must-have in your game library if you're the kind and of person... And it takes up somewhat little space, and you probably already have poker chips of some kind if you're a gamer. Yeah, it's a deck of cards, special deck of cards, a couple of challenge cards, and little betting cards that remind you like what the order of the... Yeah, you don't the, even uh, really need the betting cards. You really just need the deck. I think you need the chips. betting cards... So it'll tell you. They're very you, helpful if people don't know how to play, but once you're all good at the game, you don't need that anymore. I think you'll always need them so you will never forget the order of victory. If you play the game enough, you will know the order of victory. Yeah, just you're going to remember that a straight is less than a full house, less than a floosh. Yes, because it's much easier to get a straight when there's six suits. Yep, but a and rainbow ten. straight versus four or five of a kind. A rainbow straight is less than four of a kind yep. and less than five of a and kind. And I see you can see that over my shoulder because I have the betting card. No, because right I remember now. that rainbow straight is in the top left. Yeah. Floosh is in the bottom right. And then just to the left of floosh should be uh, regular straight. But seriously, if you then, run board game nights, if you are the guy who shows up at a con and has like, hey, I got a game we should play, this is the, the this is like the perfect example of a social game. That is good to get everybody warmed up and to get the kinds of people who don't want to learn a difficult game and balk at playing a game to start playing a game and get really invested in it. I think this is also really good. If you find those people, I, I know a lot of them who are, they like to play poker, right? They're yeah. in the Texas Hold'em or whatever, but they, it's hard to get them to play real board games. This could be the bridge game. You can get them into sort of that like fluge culture while they're still playing a poker-ish game that they'll like. And you can go straight from fluge culture to brick for wood culture. Yeah, you can. And that's the bridge. You can get them over the heap if they're unwilling to just play settlers well, look, straight Well, here's out. how Serlin sells it himself. He just gives you a set of bullet points. No player elimination. Uh, well, I guess you're not permanently eliminated. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah. No, uh, You don't have to fold all the time like you do in human poker. <laughs> <laughs> it is panda poker. No, seriously, as an aside. But you do fold a lot. Folding is... If <laughs> you... Play poker with people, and you are not a poker person. My only advice to you is you need to fold about five times more often than you think you do. Last time I played poker for real monies in college, I basically just folded whenever I didn't have a hand and didn't fold when I did have a hand and started raising the roof. And I just had, when I lost, because I had no hand, I lost almost nothing. And then when I did have the hand, someone usually stayed in, and I had the hand, so I made mad money, and then I won. Quote, it's actually fun to play for its own sake when no real money is on the line. The pandas are laughing and joking the whole way through. That is true. But the game has two sets. It has its core rules, and you can just play it, and it's totally fun. Just pick up game, go nuts, poker. It's awesome. Uh, then there's a section where Serlin's like, so if you want to play it for real money, if you're panda enough to play it for real money. <laughs> are you panda enough? Here are the for serious rules, and all Whoa. they do is... What's the difference with real money? <clears throat> well, I mean, you're playing with real money. What's the fixed bet? You set it, like, at a, a dime, a dollar, I forget. It's in the back of the book. It's basically Benjamin, the same. A, it's a basically the same. The only difference is the bank doesn't cover the money that you owe when bullshit happens. Obviously, you can't go it's frolic in the forest and get free money from the bank to come back in after you've lost. Uh. You can buy back in with money. <laughs> Money. <laughs> money. <laughs> real money. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to try playing this with real money at PAX. No one else was super into it. I'm not super into jail. 
I would not be worried about jail. I'm sure if you played games for real money and for- enforcers noticed, you would not be welcome um, back. Scott, at even if you're playing for real money, you use poker chips. You settle up afterward. Jeez. <laughs> it's like that's like me playing hearts for money in middle All right, school. I'll be the bookie and I will also play. That's fine. Good. There's, we're not giving the house a cut. And uh, oops. <laughs> uh, the book is slightly skewed here. Yeah, yo, everyone owes me 10 bucks. But th- there's no <laughs> book. There's poker chips. What, are you going to have counterfeit poker chips? No, I'm writing down in the book what happened, and then you'll forget what happened, then we'll look in the book and see no, what we happened. Don't buy, you know what you do? You take your fucking poker chips, we all go somewhere, like at a restaurant, and then we exchange poker chips for money. <laughs> That's how it goes down. So everyone walks out with chips in a little baggie? Yeah, I'm not trusting you and your bookie. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta write down how many chips everyone has. He blagged the bookies. <laughs> <laughs> but I Tyrone. Seriously, Tyrone. it is rare that I will just uncategorically and without reservation recommend a game for these purposes. Now, granted, this isn't greatest game of all time no, territory. No, but it's this not is, even close this, to Tigger's and Euphrates. This fills a slot in the game library that no other game currently fills. Right? It is. It so. In that respect, there is no other game that you can buy to do what Pandante does, which is Panda Poker. So you should get it, if possible. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>